Okay, so welcome to uh, David McNutt's second lecture in his series on the Cartan Carl Hedy algorithm and Cartan invariance for space times. Please. Okay, so um, yesterday, uh, last time I talked about the Cartan method and how it relates to the Cartan Carl Hedy algorithm. Uh, so this is a classification approach using the curvature tensor and its covariant derivatives. And we're working in four uh, dimensions, and I'm going to talk about some of the tools that will make this easier to work with. And in particular, I'm going to talk about spinners uh, and the Newman Penrose um, formalism. Um, I will not talk very much about the Newman Penrose formalism. I've made a philosophical decision to keep this fairly algebraic for now. Um, what I will cover today is what spinners are, uh, a few useful theorems that will allow working with spinners uh, in an easier way over tensors. And uh, we'll continue with that, the more um, the derivatives, the analysis next time. So we're going to start out with something from uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, I do not meddle with quantum mechanics, but I know the spin matrices, uh, Pauli spin matrices, um, very well. So in four dimensions, because we want to work in four dimensions, we have these Hermitian matrices. Uh, so that would correspond to a time-like one. Uh, you'll see what I mean by time-like in a moment. There's one space-like. Here, I is, of course, the square root of negative one. Uh, so if you check these, take the transpose and their conjugate, uh, they are Hermitian. And if we consider an observer, in 4D, so normally we would see that as a vector. then we can actually write this as a matrix. So I'm going to use this notation to talk about it that way. Um, another way to write it would be a summation uh, using Einstein notation. And what we have for these components is, yes, I've chosen a weird basis. We now have a representation as a Hermitian matrix. Um, so here, uh, the special linear two group, the complex plane acts on this. Um, and so we have um, Q is in cell two C, and we have just the transformation rule that each of the poly matrices, and I, I won't include indices for the moment, uh, so we have that, that, then the, what I'm going to write as the conjugate transpose. So nothing exotic. Okay, um, so one thing to notice about this is that the determinant of this matrix is the Euclidean norm, um, not the Euclidean norm, the Lorentz norm. The is sometimes, first of all, is it letter N or letter U for vector or observer? U is vector. U is vector, right? Yeah. Sometimes you write indices down, sometimes up. Yes, that's a bad habit of mine. Um, yeah, I apologize. Those should all be uh, uppercase. Or should be up. Yeah. I work in a frame, so most of the time these things don't matter to me. I just raise and lower without with impunity. Okay, so this is the Lorentzian norm. Um, what we notice is that uh, if we have Q plus and Q minus, that gives us the same uh, L in SO13. Notice here that I'm going to work with a signature where it's plus, minus, minus, minus. Um, the reason I've chosen to done, uh, do this is that when you talk about spinners, this notation is easier to find in the literature. So if anyone doesn't know what it is, they can look it up. And it's it, it's the opposite of the signature that I used uh, in the previous talk. 
Um, so I'll just talk about spinners with this one because there's more to read about it. Um, so SL2C is simply connected. It's continuous, so we can always bring to the identity. And that means um, we're going to pres uh, preserve orientation. Um, it's proper, so it's going to preserve time orientation, whether when we do this transformation, it's going to preserve future pointing vectors versus uh, past pointing vectors and an orientation, so the right-hand rule, unfortunately. Uh, this is a way to encode um, four vectors, real valued four vectors, into a two by two Hermitian matrix. And what we want to do is build this up a little more rigorously by making simpler objects. So we're going to work with um, complex uh, two tensors or two vectors. Uh, and these are spinners. Uh, this can be done in, in you know, any dimension. It's, it becomes more of a headache, but I think in four dimensions, it's really nice. So what we're going to do here is build all of the necessary uh, tensorial objects in this signature, uh, Lorentzian geometries this way. Um, but for the moment, what we're going to do is take spinner algebra, bring it over to vector algebra, and then um, start taking tensors and bringing them over to spinners or bring them back to spinners. So we'll start out with spinner algebra. So um, we have a definition because this is a symplectic structure. And that is, um, this is again, not, this is a university introduction. Uh, you'll find this in a textbook, but we're gonna think, um, oops, uh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we're going to deal with a symplectic vector space. And this is a 2n, where n is an integer dimensional uh, vector space. Uh, we'll call this S um, with a bilinear symmetric operator, uh, product rather. I have to be a little careful. I'm sorry. Uh, the pen is finicky. <laughs> So we have a product. Um, and I'm going to ask that this is over the complex. So we, we're taking two objects, and we're going to make a scalar that goes into the complex uh, numbers. And we have two conditions. The first condition is that if I have uh, two spinners or two elements of the vector space, then it's uh, anti-symmetric. That's the skew part. Um, and the other one is that perhaps this actually follow? Uh, no, it doesn't follow. This is the, the non-degenerate part. So we're going to ask that it is non-degenerate. Um, this is equal to 0 if for all eta in S. Uh, I'm going to say that that's zeta is 0. My zetas and g's look the same. Um, so this is a symplectic structure. And we want to look at transformations that will preserve that. and we look at a linear transformation in this vector space, so S to S, we'll call this Q. Um, we'll say it's symplectic. If it preserves our skew we, uh, scalar quantity. So here I've applied my linear transformation to both of my um, vector elements. And the skew scalar product does not see it. So I hate <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so this is the symplectic group, uh, SBN. We will, of course, stay to two, uh, two n is equal to two, so we'll be dealing with four. So uh, we've already seen this, but we've seen that uh, SP2 is ISO, we actually be explicit. to SL2C. Um, now, actually, it's a double cover. So for each element in SP2, I have two that go to one. Um, but that's OK. Um, I'm just going to make this a quotation mark because I keep seeing it in textbooks. Um, OK, so we have S. Um, we want a dual space. So we'll call this S star. And so what I'll do is I'll take eta in S and use my uh, symmetric product. 
and I'll call this uh, for the moment eta star. And this lives in S star, the dual. Uh, and we can see that that actually does work. So if we have um, this goes from S into C. Sorry, I apologize. The uh, this quantity. So we're taking an element of S and we're mapping into the complex line. Okay, so we can work with a basis here. We're going to introduce a spin basis. So uh, we're going to pick one element. We'll call it Omicron. Uh, and take iota here such that Omicron iota is non zero. And we can. Um, we can normalize this. So we can take this and choose this equal to one. That is permitted. There is a transformation that will do us for us. Um, it's not within SP2, but that's OK. We can normalize. So L is not unique. Because this is a skew scalar product, I could take iota prime uh, and shift it by Omicron. And that also works. So this the spin basis isn't unique, but that doesn't matter for us um, for now. And there's a notation here. Um, given any element in S, I can look at its components with a, a big A. And so I can write this as. like this. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose OA, B10, and um, the representation here as 0, 1. And I'll work with that. Um, sometimes people introduce a, a little more confusing notation uh, where they have A primes. I, I won't be doing that in this talk. Uh, similarly, we have, if we have zeta A and S, um, we'll have zeta a in s star. So we'll raise an index. So index up means vector. Index down means dual. Um, now we can do things. We can work with this abstract index notation. So if two objects share the same index, we can add them together. Um, we can subtract them. Uh, if they don't share the same index, we can't do that. Um, inner product works very well. Um, and yeah, so for example, here, what I mean is this is the dual of eta a. That means such that, that I take eta a and I put it into the skew symmetric product, and this exists in S star. OK, so that is what we're going to work with. We're going to work with a spin basis, and we're actually going to do uh, some structure here. Um, but the first thing we can do is if we're working with a spin basis is we can actually write our symplectic structure as a matrix. So here we could think of uh, some sort of product and the dual of S dual, the, the double product of this. Or we could have an element in um, using the index notation, which I will try to get used to uh, using more in here. These are equivalent. And I'm going to ask that I have eta AB. Oh, goodness. And to ensure that it's skew, I have anti-symmetry. So if I swap two indices, I have that. And we'll say that this is a valence two tensor. Um, rank seems to have some meaning with spinners, and I'm just going to avoid it. So this means that if I have two arbitrary elements in the space, I can write this as eta a b, uh, zeta a, goodness, b. 
And because I have iota, I have a spin basis. This means that relative to my spin basis, goodness, I can write this as 0, negative 1, 1, 0, really reflecting, reflecting the fact that it's symplectic. And uh, my spin basis has kind of, if you want, a norm 1. Uh, one thing to notice here is that the determinant of epsilon is non-zero. So we have an epsilon a, b in uh, s cross s. Or again, I could say, sorry, I don't need those indices. Yeah, thank you. Didn't render. Um, or we could say that in this notation. I find this notation uh, a little confusing, but I'll just leave it as is for completeness. Um, so here we have uh, another valence 2 tensor. Uh, and in this case, we're going to do one thing a little different. We're going to introduce a negative sign. We're going to take its inverse. And goodness. And so this will be 0, negative 1, 1, 0. And if we go to our spin basis, I could write this as OA iota B, sorry, uh, iota A omicron B. So we're just anti-symmetrizing these. Uh, similarly, here I could write this as, did I actually forget to say this? I did. Sorry. Um, So again, we, we can work with this way. The reason I like this is I can actually see explicitly what the transformations are that I want. Um, one last thing uh, before I say any further, though. The reason I've included this negative sign uh, is because if I apply the inverse to um, one of these and raise the, the index, um, I can rewrite this as this. So what I've done is I've just noticed that that z to b, I can write this as uh, the skew scalar product represented as a two a valence two tensor with a vector. Uh, and here I can use matrix multiplication like I would want to. And I get z to c. And here the, the negative is basically so I can preserve identity. Yes. OK, so finally, we can get to linear transformations. I'm going to have to go a little faster. Um, so we can just do a general linear transformation. Um, so Omicron becomes alpha Omicron plus beta iota A. Uh, iota in the new basis is this. Or we can just see this as a matrix. So we have alpha, beta. Uh, gamma and delta is our Q. And if this is going to be a new spin basis, that'll only happen if uh, determinant of Q is 1. So Q has to live in the special linear 2 complex group to have a special linear. Um, so, so if we want a new spin basis, we have to live there. And that will be useful. I'll talk about it when I actually come back to the newman penrose one lesson. Uh, one more thing. We have a Jaco uh, Jacobi identity here that will be useful for us. So here, the Jacobi identity can be written in, in indices or spinner indices. Here, we're anti symmetrizing over B, C, and D. And of course, this is equal to 0. Um, so this will be very helpful. Uh, I could expand this out. I, I won't uh, expand it out in terms of indices. But because of the anti-symmetry in C and D, there's really only three terms we have to worry about. There's nothing really surprising here. But what I care about it is this lemma. So if I have a spinner of valence n, so there are n indices. Uh, So I'm putting no conditions on the spinner. It's whatever I like. Then, goodness, um, if I look at two indices, so 
So I'm going to take the IF and JF indices. Then this is uh, the same as symmetrization of AI and AJ plus one half epsilon. Just one second. I have to make sure my notation is good. AI, AJ. And here we have another spinner where I've raised one index and I'm contracting over it. And the rest are the same. So what I'm doing here is I'm picking out two arbitrary indices. I'm symmetrizing it, and that's the part that matters. And then the rest of information is a lower rank tensor. And the proof here, um, you can just go to valence two. Nothing really changes. Well, why, why a lower rank could just raise on index? A uh, lower valence, rather. Uh, we've raised an index, but um, they are traced. So AI, perhaps maybe this would be I wanted to indicate that the, um, the two indices were summed. So I'll call this B and B. So this is a um, okay. balance N minus two. Okay. Uh, so go to valence two. That's, you can do that without loss of genre on LD and use Jacobi identity. Um, I have a few proofs. I'll just leave it at that one for that one, that's short. You can just use the Jacobi identity, and, and this identity falls out for valence two, and it's very easily generalized. Um, that's skew symmetric? No, wait. Uh, okay. so, so, so this would be, uh, sorry, this is a uh, general. It's, it's, it's general tensor, right? Yeah, on, on, on the right hand side, yeah. uh, left hand side, purely general. It's that's, whatever. That is in the two dimensions, right? Uh, do you mean like for, for dyads? Or do you mean two indices? Yeah. No, this will hold for, well, yeah, for only two, but you'll see in a minute. Yeah. Um, so we have a theorem that comes from this lemma that will be helpful. And this is why I prefer spinners over vectors. Um, so any spinner, again, I will use tau of valence n, is the sum of a totally symmetric spinner. So here, um, the indices are totally symmetrized. And uh, we're going to do outer products. So those are just tensor products. Uh, we're not working with inner products at all of the epsilons. And what are we inner, uh, taking outer products with? We are taking outer products with totally symmetric. So again, the indices are symmetrized, fully symmetrized. Spinners of lower valence. Um, so this is the real benefit, is I can decompose any spinner into a totally symmetric part that maybe I want to focus on, and then lower uh, totally symmetric parts that are uh, producted with epsilon. So the epsilon isn't bringing any information, and I can just focus on these totally symmetric parts and work with that. Uh, so when this comes to the cartan lidi algorithm, uh, we, we will see, and maybe I will show an example when, uh, where this is used, where the only new information is coming from the totally symmetric part, the valence n, and everything else is previously known. So it really simplifies the algorithm. Um, there is a proof for this. Um, I don't think I want to talk about it for now, but um, yeah, we'll just keep going. So this and is a yeah. All the reducible representations I mentioned to asymmetric powers. It is yeah. There's a little bit more work. There's an uh, introduction of notation, but it's just repeating Jacobi. Uh, and this lemma. Um, so here, we're going to make a note because we're going to work with this. Um, S is a vector space uh, over the complex numbers. And here, if I have alpha plus C, oh goodness, um, eta plus C, Zeta, that, that lives in S. And if I take its conjugate, well, I have to conjugate everything uh, because this is a tensor. Um, we're going to say that this lives in S bar. Uh, and this, between the two, we have an anti 
isomorphism. So they are not isomorphic. One argument is for the fact that purely for complex conjugation, you have this behavior. And if, if it was an isomorphism, then I could take this and, oh, goodness, map it to this. So basically, because I can't do that in a sensible way, complex conjugation is, is it has to be done for every single object. It is actually an anti-isomorphism. Um, what this means is we actually have uh, a new vector space that we can work with. So because we have this anti-isomorphism. So to distinguish S from S bar, uh, we're going to use, unfortunately, primed indices. So for example, um, here we would have, um, so alpha A will now go to alpha A bar, which then is equal to alpha bar A prime. And similarly, for objects with an index down, just uh, valence one, we'll keep it simple. If we take the complex conjugate of that whole object, and I'm sorry, that's supposed to be a whole one. Uh, what we will have is alpha bar A prime. Um, now, what's nice is if we take the conjugate of our scalar, um, skew scalar product, it's real valued, so we, we're just priming the indices. So now we have a skew scalar product on this new vector space, just like we would expect. And we can use S, it's dual, S bar, and S bar dual to build tensors. Or for now, um, take tensors and bring them over to spinners. Um, so S and S bar are different. And that means that we can just move the indices here freely. So for example, I can write TAB prime as the same as TB prime A as an example. Now for another example, this is not the case because that would be a symmetric tensor and I haven't made any conditions on this. So if you're primed index, you can just move them around. You can group them together, which maybe would be preferable, or you can put them into pairs. Um, but one conclusion from this is, this is not a two by two matrix because there are two different vector spaces acting on this. And only the, the infill Ben, goodness, Ben der Warden symbols kind of have this privilege of using two indices uh, and being treated like a matrix. Okay, so, so the story now is we're going to go to spinners. As a, you know, this is always said, and I will not be the difference here. I'm going to say our square roots of null vectors. So how do uh, square roots work? Well, uh, if I have negative two and I square, I have four, and similarly with two. Yes. Basic math. Um, we're going to come back to this idea of Hermitian. I've assumed it as kind of known, but. Um, since I'm talking about a spinner, perhaps it's best I actually defined it. So a Hermitian spinner, I'll use tau again, uh, satisfies tau conjugate is equal to tau. And remembering the poly matrices, this is something we, we desire. We want to build, uh, in a sense, poly matrices. Um, so first conclusion is this requires uh, sorry, not an index pairs like uh, A and A prime as an example, or things like that. Um, there are relative positions. Goodness, that's um, very rough. I apologize. That's an R.
So this is a little vague, but the relative positions are the same. So an example of that would be T A A prime. This is going to live in S cross S conjugate um, is an example of this. So the, uh, the, here it's a very simple example. There's only one position, they're, they're vectors. So another example I, I will give in a bit, but first I'm gonna introduce my spin basis. So I have my spin basis or S, and I will just take their conjugate for S bar. Um, then for example, for this one, this very simple example, again, not a matrix, we have a notation where I'll just keep the uh, Omicrons are zeros, iotas are ones, very suggestive. It stands for the division, it defines S and S bar. Yes, it is, yeah, sorry. Um, this is yeah, and again, sometimes the books use this, um, but we're we're talking about tensor primes. Yes. Um, so I just want this out for completeness. Now, if we need this to be complex, um, Hermitian. Just right over here. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. So if we have that T A A prime is equal to T conjugate, again, A A prime, uh, then T zero, zero prime, and uh, T11 one, one prime have to be real numbers. And furthermore, uh, these have to be complex conjugates of each other. Otherwise things just don't work very well. Okay, so the conclusion from this is that um, we have We have a basis of four elements. And our conclusion uh, Hermitian spinners in S tensor product S bar um, they form a real vector space in dimension of dimension four. So we could basically say that that is isomorphic to TPM. And again, isomorphic is used loosely here. You'll see why, uh, but we'll just, yeah. And similarly, ditto, uh, I mean, I think it's an idiom in English, but the same for Hermitian spinners with two indices down. So that's in S star product, S star bar. And again, here we would have T uh, A A prime is what I'm thinking of here. So if that's Hermitian, it forms that. And we could say that that is isomorphic to the tangent space, uh, the cotangent space of a point on the, on the manifold. Um, so the rule we're, we're going to make now uh, without the van der Waals symbols, um, always ruin names, I apologize. Um, the infill van der Woerden symbols is uh, a rule. We're going to say A, A prime goes to a tensor index and we'll go with the lowercase. Um, so one thing we could do, uh, again, here, I want to be clear that we are not yet working uh, in a region. We're, we're just looking at a vector space at a point, but we will allow our spinners to vary. For the moment, I'm going to introduce my basis at a point. I can introduce this L vector, which looks like this, uh, my N vector. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll abuse A and use it for all of them. Uh, and then similarly, I will have uh, two vectors. Uh, 
this. Um, these two are complex conjugates. Uh, these two are real. Sorry, this is a little messy, but I wanted to be clear. Um, so furthermore, we, we have something else. Um, L and N are special. They are null directions. Um, now, we could do the same um, with, uh, we're, we're going to build lower product ones. We're, we're going to avoid raising and lowering the metric for a second. Um, so this is in TPM, let's say. This is a span for TPM. And then similarly, if I work with spinners with the balance down, um, with the index down. Well, unsurprisingly, we have that and that. Uh, so L and N now as uh, forms. And we have M and M bar. Uh, and this will be for the cotension space. Now, if, if I contract um, LA and LA, well, that would be zero. Um, similarly, uh, NA and A is zero. So these are null. But um, because I'm using the signature here, LA and A is equal to plus of one. So again, it's because I'm using a different signature. I'm using plus, minus, minus, minus. Um, OK, so we, we have built two different spaces. But the observation here is uh, we can raise and lower indices. Spinner indices using epsilon AB or epsilon AB. Oh, that is very rough. I apologize. Or there are complex conjugates. Um, and we know that with, with vectors, we can raise and lower metrics. And we can build a metric. I mean, you've already seen this. I've already shown that we, we can diagonalize a metric and build it out of a frame. Here, we're taking the frame. Uh, we're working with spinners, and we're using the ADAs here. This, so the representation here depends on the spin basis. Um, but what we can do is take our A and write it as AB, uh, AA prime and AB prime. And here I will gather the primed and unprimed indices together. And with a little bit of work, if you want the properties of a metric, you have this. And similarly, again, with uh, spinner indices up, I forgot my bar. We have this. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, for once, I don't need that. Uh, the complex conjugate of epsilon is, of course, real valued. OK, so th that's fun. Um, Hmm. Not expecting that. Oh. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> okay, good. Wonderful. Um so the the moral here is Um, we can always build an orthonormal uh, tetrad. We can work with a metric any way we like. Uh, but first, I, I sorry, I need a definition. Uh, computer errors took me by surprise. So if we have a set of vectors, the form of basis of the tangent space or cotangent space, here I'll talk about the tangent space. Um, uh, This is called uh, a Newman Penrose. Uh, 
null tetrad. Uh, this is also called a complex null tetrad, just for terminology. Um, and with this tetrad, um, it's a nice exercise. You can do the spinners, um, but we have this representation, and similarly for its inverse. Uh, I will again remind everyone that the signature is different from my previous talk. So um, the sign is, signs are a little different. And we can always So we can always switch to an orthonormal tetrad where the time-like direction is positive and our space-like directions are negative. So formally, we have an object. Um, this transformation um, is given by uh, infilled van der Waarden symbols. So here, what we would like is if we look at our metric that here, I'm going to introduce hatted indices. Um, this thing takes two spinner indices, one complex, one real, and produces a vector index. And again, this we can actually think of as a matrix. Um, and a suitable choice that will coincide with um, uh, for for this property is it, it coincides with the spin basis is that I choose this um, where I just have to be a little careful and appropriately take a square root just to normalize things all right. Um, and the dual of this guy, because we have vectors and we have one forms, is to, again, formally like this symbol. Um, but now we have to be a little careful because we have Lorentzian signature. So I'm going to have this lambda subscript A. It is not a vector. It is just a scalar that takes a certain value. And we're going to ask that uh, lambda, yeah, two is equal to negative one. And otherwise, this is equal to one for a hat not equal to two. So um, you use hat. That's just still the vector in this is right? Yeah. Um, so uh, in particular, I should say that, um, what am I saying? Uh, yeah, it, it's just a bad habit that propagated. Uh, the hats are not necessary. They're just to say that we're going from uh, a spinner basis, a, a spin basis, to a Newman Penrose basis. So, um, yeah, perhaps I will, to avoid confusion, because I chose an homogeneity. Okay, so. Uh, okay. We are near the end of this. So we have a, a nice theorem. And um, so we have a non-vanishing uh, real vector. Then I have a representation as a spinner. And I have either plus or minus of um, kappa A. Uh, my kappas are quite poor, so apologize. I apologize. Um, and here we will say that plus is future pointing. And negative is uh, past pointing. 
And this choice of going from uh, plus or minus, um, so, so it's two to one, but if we make this choice, we preserve orientation. So already we're, we're getting one of the ingredients of a proper uh, tetrad. So a tetrad that respects time and space orientation. So we're gonna now assume that we can now really move our standards around. So some subset of the manifold, I'm just going to say this, uh, M is our space time. Um, the first thing we can do is we can pick uh, kappa A, let's say, and um, U A uh, on this region or in this region. And I don't have time to talk about this, but I will say that there is a flag that we have here. So time orientation. Uh, comes from this theorem. So we make a choice of plus or minus, whatever you like, the, the, the future or past to be. Um, spatial or orientation. Um, so if we pick, let's say kappa is our choice, uh, kappa makes a null direction. And then if we complete our spin basis, we can get two uh, spatial directions. So I am unfortunately going to have to scroll up for a moment, but I just want to point to one thing. Here, let's say I've chosen kappa to be omicron, uh, and I've chosen my mu to be iota. Um, we have two complex spatial vectors. We can look at the real and imaginary part. This forms a flag. And if we do a transformation that I hopefully will talk about, we can see that the flag moves around in a very peculiar way. And perhaps I can talk about that next time uh, before I go into analysis. What I really wanna do is go to the Petrov classification in the last 10 minutes, because I think it's beautiful. Um, I think the Petrov classification in terms of uh, anti-self-dual bivectors, that's a six-dimensional space, is very beautiful. Um, but I think actually the conversation in terms of spinners is better. <laughs> that's a dangerous thing to say, uh, but it's very simple and elegant. So my motivation here is we're just going to be giving ourselves spinner uh, tensors and turning them into spinners. And I'll take as motivation uh, the anti-self-dual file tensor. So here we're taking the vial tensor and we're making a complex object. So we have the vial tensor as we normally do. Um, in four dimensions, we don't really care about where we're contracting indices. Um, so I'm going to take the, uh, the last two of the vial tensor and we have this object and that is complex. Um, if we use uh, the Hodge tool, which is coming from the alternating tensor, uh, we get a negative sign, essentially. So here I'm using epsilon again. So what we'll ask is that um, as a tensor, and uh, we'll say it's totally anti-symmetric. Uh, so this notation is saying that all the information is here. And if I take a contraction, a full contraction with all indices and a copy of this, I get that this is equal to negative 24. And we can do one more choice relative to the Newman Penrose formalism or an orthonormal frame. We're going to say uh, uh, one. I, I made ortho frame. Um, when you go to a complex null tetrad, it becomes I. Um, so spinner analog here is this. We have epsilon, A, B, C, D, 
Um, and now we're going to take those uh, prime indices, B prime, C prime, D prime. There's a very natural reason why I'm staying with epsilon, and that is because I can write this in terms of uh, the epsilons. I mean, it's not really surprising. We're talking about a, an object that's basically permutations, so of course we can write in terms of transpositions. Um, I suppose the details are uh, the devils in the details, not the details in the devils. Um, so we, we have that. Uh, but what's nice about that is we have a theorem, and this is going to be the building block. And I'm happy that I've gotten to the theorem. I don't know if I can get to the Petrov classification, and I'm rambling. Um, so if we're going to assume that we have a fully anti-symmetric spinner, um, I, I won't write the usual definition. Uh, this is okay for relativists, so it's okay for me. Uh, then there are univalent spinners. That means spinners of valent, uh, valence one. And I am going to have to abuse indices here. So I'm going to say it's alpha one, uh, A one, up to alpha n, A n. So th they can be distinct or they could be the same, um, but that's okay. Then I have that this spinner, valence n, is equal to the outer product of these n univalent spinners. So definitions, or just notations, um, these alpha i, a i, again, terrible use of uh, indices, um, but it's the best I can do, are principal null spinners of uh, tau. So that's just a definition. And because we have this nice relationship, we can make them into squares and we can make them into vectors, null vectors. Um, I am so sorry for this. Um, I'm going to call this uh, A. A. Um, Did it something? I don't know. Oh, um, it's sort of skews in it, really. No, this is a symmetrization. So you try skew symmetry tensor and see. It's all symmetric. Yeah, yeah it's all but the bar. Yeah, it, it is symmetric. Um we will get to that hopefully. Okay. That's 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 parenthesis. Yeah. It's symmetric. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking it's difficult to read. Oh okay. Yes. So I apologize. Yeah, everything is symmetric, and that is important. So we have um So we'll say in all directions because there is still some freedom in what we can do to this. So we have principle in all directions. Um, so the proof is very straightforward and I would actually like to give it because it's nice. Um, so we're gonna treat it as homogeneous uh, polynomials. Of uh, degree N with two variables. I don't understand. So any symmetric tensor is decomposable? What, what, what is the statement? Any symmetric spinner is decomposable. That's a symmetric product. Any fully symmetric spinner. Any binary form and binary n form is decomposable into linear. Yeah, that's, that's the statement. It's two dimensional. It's two dimensional. Yeah, so it's on C2. Yeah. On C2. It's everything yeah. on C2. Yeah. Um, so what we can do is we can divide by variables, it's homogeneous, and we can just factorize this fundamental theorem of algebra. We're done. So a very quick proof. Um, OK, so why is this important? Well, um, if I take the vial tensor, I can just bring that over using my recipe. Um, and I'll gather the indices together. So A, B, C, D become A prime times A, or not times A. Let me just write it out. And what I can do is write this using my previous theorem. Uh, 
we, we will actually derive this later explicitly, but for now, this is fine. as such. So here we have a totally symmetric tensor. We don't have anything of lower rank, which we kind of would expect because it's a vowel tensor. It's very unique. But if I go to the anti-self dual, uh, that becomes, uh, maybe I shouldn't do equality, but I'll, I'll say that. We have this psi spinner. Oh, goodness. And here, this is totally symmetric. What happened here? So, so, so this is something I'm hoping to talk about in my next talk when I start doing analysis with spinners. But you, you can do this by brute force. You can impose the. Um, so C star is it, that's that's hot dual, right? Uh, that isn't hot dual. That is the anti self dual tensor. So um, if I go no, up, no, no, oh, either hot dual or just anti self dual. So it's it's. The vowel tensor plus its Hodge tool. Okay. Plus I times its Hodge tool. Yeah. Very nice tensor uh, to work with. Um, so this can be written in terms of three, sorry, four univalent spinners. Actually, interesting quirk in four dimensions. Um, no, no, actually, I won't say anything. Um, so we have four principal null spinners or four principal null directions. And um, yeah, so I need to introduce a definition. Um, if we have a spinner of valence n that is fully symmetric, it close. So we're going to ask that we can decompose this, uni uh, th this spinner of rank M into univalent spinners, but there's repetition. Then we're going to say it's uh, algebraically special. And otherwise, Uh, algebraically uh, general. Uh, we can do this with any spinner, but in uh, for the vial tensor, it becomes very, very nice. Um, uh, or I could talk about the spinner um, at this point because there's a natural way to transform between the two. It is often interchanged. I will I will talk about the spinner. Okay, this is okay. So the the boring case, I'll index zero. That's type O. Uh, so this uh, the spinner is zero. Very boring. There's no information there from a classification perspective. We don't want that, but it does happen, um, particularly in cosmology. So type I is um, we can write that as one 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 kind of like a quasi-segra uh, type. And we're saying that, for example, CABD is algebraically general. There is all sorts of information, um, but there's no re repetition. So type two, notation-wise, we can write as two, one, one. And so this is algebraically special. I won't say anything. Uh, So as two repeated null directions. Um, so we're, we're, we're almost done. Um, third case is type D, where now we have two pairs of repeated directions. Um, I'm going to 
just write it that repeated <laughs> sorry um or is type n so here we just have one repeated direction I have skipped one. I apologize. Um, I can't count, apparently. Uh, so here we have four and then five. So type N is we have four. Type three, unsurprisingly, is we have uh, three and one. And that is that. So we don't actually have to start looking at um, self-dual um, self operators in a six-dimensional space of self-dual bivectors, although that is very, very interesting. And we can actually, in this way, I, I, I have to quote um, Penrose, and perhaps this will be another diagram of his that I will tattoo onto myself. Um, is this really nice diagram of all the various ways these spacetimes can simplify. Uh, so this is the Penrose diagram for the Petrov type. Um, similarly, we can do this with uh, the Ricci spinner, which is the analog of the Ricci tensor. We will look at it as the trace-free uh, Ricci tensor, um, Vici tensor, and we can do this again. again. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there so that I can bring this back to the alignment classification next time. Thank you. Questions for David. Yeah. Maybe one very nice question. Why you don't have uh, an arrow from two to G? It should be there. Yes, it is. Sorry, I apologize. Okay. Yeah.